Guys, Lee with LG Speed and Custom here, and in this video, we are finally making a tuck and roll seat cover for the back seat in my 1947 Ford. So this is my 1947 Ford sedan. Done a lot of videos on this car here on the channel, but not very many on the interior. So when I got this car, it had no interior at all. I have built all of this from scratch. This is all real Naga hide, real tuck and roll. You'll notice though, the back seat is not done. The reason the back seat is not done, when I bought this car, I bought this car off my friend Ross. And like I said, it had no interior at all in it. And he had a back seat that he wasn't using that had great upholstery on it. So he's like, hey, you know what, Lee? You can take this seat for now. Use it, use it if you need something to like, you know, make patterns off of or just to get the car on the road. Go ahead, use it. When you get your back seat reupholstered, give it back to me. That was like two, two and a half years ago. So I think it's time that we actually finish this seat and, and get Ross his seat back so that's what we're going to do in this video the first thing that we're going to do is i have just used some plastic and pulled a template off of the front seat here because i want to get this line where our piping is right here we're going to transfer that onto the new rear seat with the idea that that piping will start where this seam is and then come up on the same angle as the front seat and across the back so now that we've got this template we can head on upstairs to the upholstery room and start figuring out our new seat. We're way upstairs in the upholstery area now. And here's the original back seat. Here's our cushion. As you can see, there's absolutely nothing left of it. That we got to completely do from scratch. But our backrest is still fairly complete which is great because we can use this old cover even though it's all crusty and deteriorating and you know very crunchy about to fall apart we can still use this for our patterns which makes it a hundred times easier than starting from scratch so because of that we're gonna ignore that right now and just focus on this one we're gonna do the easy one first just to build up a little motivation so put that one under the bench and then lay our template out on this one. So many seats you'll notice will have like a pleated section or a tuck and roll section and then a solid section. The general rule when you're doing that is that the pleated section is two thirds of the seat and the solid section is the last third. This seat, we could kind of figure out where that was because there's evidence of where it had buttons. So I've laid the straight edge across the buttons and then measured from here to our seam we've got seven and a half inches and we've got seven and a half inches so we're going to draw our line across here if we were going to salvage this seat cover i would be doing this with chalk because you could just use an air blower and blow it off but because we're just using this as a template and it's going to go in the garbage after we're going to use a grease pencil because it doesn't move as much chalk sometimes if you bump it with your hand or something you can smudge the line i mean i'm sure you guys have all used chalk before you know chalk works so we'll draw our straight edge across there and this will be our main seam where the piping where the piping will run so if we grab our template now and lay that on there I measured with my fingers, because that's how accurate you have to be in upholstery, it's really forgiving. It's like the exact opposite end of the spectrum from being a machinist. With upholstery, you know, if you're within a quarter inch, you're fine. So from this seam, if I went two fingers up, that's where the piping on our door panel, or our side panel, I guess it's a side panel, because that's not a door back there. Quarter panel, that's where the seam on our quarter panel is. So that's where we want this seam to come in our angle come down to there so I'm gonna lay this on there 
along our line here. And that looks like about where we want. Let me find a straight edge here. That's pretty close right there. Let's flip this up. Oh, I just moved it. Okay, let's flip this up. And make our new line there. So now we can transfer this to the other side. That's seven inches in. Let's go seven inches in. And again, we were two fingers, two fingers. And there we go. There's our basic shape. So this corner is actually radius a little bit. So let's find something that's similar to that radius. I think I just used like a roll of tape. That's pretty close there. There's a trick to make this perfectly symmetrical, which I'll show you guys when we pull it apart. So now we've got our, we know where our tuck and roll section is gonna be. So we can start laying that out. And from there we can do a little bit of math and figure out how much, how many pleats we need to sew into this. So the 47 has two and a quarter inch tuck and roll pleats. Our square, what I mean by that is in between like each seam is two and a quarter inches apart. Our square is two inches. However, if you take two inches and the width of, you know, a piece of chalk or a grease pencil, I've switched to chalk by the way, because the grease pencil wasn't showing up as vibrant as the chalk is. So. We're using chalk now, which is fine. Anyways, two inches plus the width of our chalk gives us two and a quarter. We've got our straight edge across the top that we know is square because we've measured it from here to here and from here to here. So if we take our square and go along our straight edge there, let's run this to our line or our end. And from there we can draw our first line. Let's slide over, square this up again, and now we can run our second line. So if we measure from there to there, center to center, we got two and a quarter inches. I'm gonna do this all the way along. Hopefully it works out. This can get a little bit weird sometimes. Sometimes you want an odd number of pleats, sometimes you want an even number of pleats. The end result, it doesn't matter which one you choose, as long as the end result, you end up with like a full pleat on each end, rather than like if we have a full pleat on this end and we get down to this end and we can only get, you know, half a pleat, we don't want that. So what we would do then is shuffle it down one so that we have an odd number of pleats rather than an even, and we would just make our two end pleats a little bit bigger to make up the difference. Having a little bit of a bigger pleat on each end looks nicer to the eye than having one that's too narrow or forced in there. So I'm gonna lay this out really quick to make sure that it's gonna work. And if it doesn't work, we can just use air, blow this off, find our center line, and then go out from there. Guess what, it worked out, we got lucky, and we've got the same distance on this end as we do on this end. So we know we can fit this many pleats in there. Now's where the math comes in. 
So before we get into the math on this, we got to do a little bit of basics here. And that is, what's the difference between tuck and roll and pleats? Because the math is different on both of them. So let me show you here. We'll do pleats first. Okay, this is just a standard pleat. You'll see many pleated seats. Pleated seats are probably the most common. And that is where you just have a single stitch like that, which creates a little divot. We can do another one here, just to give you the, the full example. Let's pretend that's two inches, that these are two inch pleats. I'm just eyeballing it, so it may not be exact two inches. It's closer, probably closer to an inch and a half. But anyways, those are what pleats look like. Pleats and tuck and roll are different. On tuck and roll, you don't actually see the stitch in there. There's no stitch. We'll do an example next to that. We'll pretend that this is you know, another two inches again. So you start by sewing a normal pleat, like so, but then you fold it so that you got your, you see you got your little stitch on the back side, you fold it right on that stitch line and then you run it through one more time. Like so. Now when you open this up, no stitch. That is tuck and roll. These are pleats. So this is like the modern version of tuck and roll. The original tuck and roll way is like you would sew together a whole series of tubes and then actually stuff cotton batting down them. And that's the way it was done in like the 40s, 50s and 60s and stuff before the invention of foam like this. I don't know when this foam came out, but I'm assuming sometime in the 70s, but before that upholstery was usually done with like cotton batting and horsehair and stuff like that. Because this foam, it just simply didn't exist yet. With this foam, it makes tuck and roll so much easier. It's not so much like true traditional tuck and roll, but when it's sewn up, it is so similar that most people can't tell the difference between true tuck and roll and this version of tuck and roll. And this is just, it's way faster. So why do we need to know math? Because when we folded that, you see this little divot in here, that sucked up three quarters of an inch of material. So on our seat that we just did over here, you'll see we have 23 seams that we have to sew up, which means all 23 of those is gonna suck up three quarters of an inch of material. So when we go to lay this out you know we got to get our measurement from here to here and then add 23 three quarters of an inches on there which is a lot of inches and that'll give us our total length so let's do some measuring and do some math so if we grab our tape measure and go from this outside edge to this outside edge gives us 55 and a half. Let's write that down. 55 and a half. Now for each side of this, we need to add an extra three eighths of an inch for our seam allowance. Our seam allowance is, if you like look on the back side of your t-shirt, for example, see that little area that's like folded over where the stitch is? That's called your seam allowance. You need three eighths of an inch for that. So three eighths of an inch and three eighths of an inch is three quarters of an inch, which will bring this up to 56 and a half inch plus three quarters of an inch is, you know, I can do math so good until there's a camera running and then my brain's just like, duh. So a half an inch would be, yeah, 56 plus another quarter is 56. Yeah, 56 and a quarter, right? Right, you guys are doing math too, right? So 56 and a quarter is what we need our length to be. However, we've got 23 pleats and each one of those pleats is gonna suck up three quarters of an inch. 
On my bench over here, I've already done the math, and 23 pleats is 17.25 inches. So we need our 56 and a quarter plus 17 and a quarter. And what does that give us? That gives us a, we're going to be a half inch there. Six plus seven is 13. Carry the one. We've got six plus one. 73 and a half inches. That's how much we need to lay out. 73 and a half inches by, we need this distance now. We go from there to our seam there is 18 plus three quarters of an inch because we need our 3 8 seam allowance and our 3 8 seam allowance. 73 and a half by 18 and three quarters. That's how big of a piece we need for our pleats. So before we get too carried away, taking this all apart, we're gonna sew this piece up first. Here's our material laid out. This is genuine Naga hide. You can still buy Naga hide. They're still in business. You think that Nagas would have gone extinct by now, but they haven't. So I've laid it out. We're gonna have to get a little creative. I don't have as much material as I thought I did. We're flush on the end here with our tape measure. And if we go this way, we are just shy of 71 inches. And if you'll remember from our math, we need 73 and a half inches, which means we're two and a half inches too short. However, because we're doing tuck and roll, we can fake this, we can make this okay. If we were doing pleats, we'd be screwed because pleats, you see the stitching, right? So if you add a piece in, when you sew those two pieces together, you're not gonna have a stitch anymore, you're gonna have a seam. But with tuck and roll, because we have the hidden seam like that, we can take and sew a piece on there and disguise it as one of our tuck and roll seams and you'll never know. So we're gonna lay this out then and we'll just add on. I quickly ran back downstairs and measured the cushion of the car and it needs to be, you know, probably the same width, pretty close, but we need 15 and three quarters of an inch. So if we take our 18 and three quarters of an inch, being this section, and then add our 15 and three quarters of an inch on for our bottom, we've got 34 and a half. So we're going to measure 34 and a half by 71 plus the extra piece to make our 73 and lay that out. The reason I want to lay them all out together and then cut it in half so that we've got our 18 section and our 15 section is that way we're guaranteed that our tuck and roll seams are all going to match and they're all going to line up okay. So to lay this out, because we got to add three eighths of an or three quarters of an inch for every seam. I've got a template that is three quarters of an inch wider already. So we can just lay this piece down, trace it, and it all works out. It's like magic. That's what we're going to do next. Okay, let's turn this piece around. Because that top edge has a little piece cut out of it, which makes it you know, even shorter. So we want to use this section here. For this, we're going to use a black grease pencil. And we want to go 34 and a half inches up. Even further than that, 34 and a half inches. So one of the reasons why pleated interiors are so much more common than tuck and roll interiors is because tuck and roll takes a lot more material. And of course, the more material you got, the more money it is. And with pleats, you just sew your one stitch, you're done. Tuck and roll, you sew your stitch, fold it, and sew it again. Meaning every single 
stitch or every single pleat that you see takes twice as long. Therefore, you know, your labor is not quite twice as long because not the whole seat is tuck and roll, but you know, it just, it takes a little bit longer to sew it all together. Thirty-four and a half. Let's grab our big straight edge again. This is just a big piece of angle iron. Uh, maybe we should do, we'll draw our center line for where we're going to cut as well. So we need a piece at 15 and three quarters and a piece at 18 and three quarters. So 15 and three quarters would put us there. And if we measure from here up, that should be 18 and three quarters. And it is 15 and three quarters, 15 and three quarters. 15 and three quarters. Let's draw this straight line as well. All right, now we've got, there's our cushion pleated area. That's where your butt's gonna sit. And then here's your backrest pleated area. This is what you're gonna lean against. Now, we need to add our 23 pleats. So to do that, we're just gonna take our piece along here, get a square, because these ends, even though this like came from a factory like that, that doesn't always mean that the ends are s square. Right there. Scooch this down a little bit and get our bottom section. All right, now we'll just lay this out until we got 23 lines. Every now and then, I'll square it back up again just to make sure that we're not veering off and getting weird. We needed 23 lines, we got 21. But like I was saying earlier, we can add on. We're gonna do that after though, because there's been times when I've done this and you start sewing it all up and then you lay it out on there. And I know it's not supposed to get weird, but sometimes things get weird and I've had it where I've needed less. So this might be one of those situations, you never know. But if we sew it up now, we can try it and see. I imagine we're probably still going to need to add on, but we can always add on at that point. So I've laid out some scrim here. What is scrim? Scrim is also sometimes called sew foam, and it is kind of a higher density foam. Like it's pretty squishy. It's not soft. And on the backside, it's got this mesh. This is just like a little cloth mesh. And what that mesh does, where did our tuck and roll sample go? Here it is here. 
What that mesh does is as you're sewing through here, the mesh stops the thread from pulling through because foam like, you know, you can tear through foam pretty easy. And if you don't have this mesh on here, the thread will do just that. It will tear through the foam and then you won't have your, your puffiness, your depth anymore. So that's what scrim is. This particular scrim is half inch thick. It's known as half inch scrim. I prefer to use this for seats because it gives it a pretty puffy look. Uh, for door panels, I'll use quarter inch scrim, which is the exact same as this, only quarter inch thick instead of half inch. Doesn't give you the depth, but on a door panel, sometimes you don't want that depth because it can make it too weird when you're trying to like wrap a door panel and get all the door panel bits back on. So we're gonna lightly glue this down. The glue is literally just to hold this on here while we run it through the sewing machine. Because once the threads, like you sew all those lines and obviously the threads are gonna hold it. So we don't need a, a lot, just a little bit. Just so it doesn't wiggle around on us. Another thing that you can do if you don't want to do this is like kind of pin this down and then go through and sew the perimeter on. So I do that more with leather rather than vinyl. Make sure we're wrinkle free. And we'll do this side. Let's cut this out and then we can take it over to the sewing machine and start the super fun, monotonous, boring task of sewing all these straight lines. All right, let's get ready to sew this up. I'm not gonna sew the very end ones just cause like I was talking earlier, sometimes things get weird so if I start usually like the second one in, then you know we can save the last two for fine tuning if we need to. Uh, because we're gonna start with the pleats that are then gonna get folded and you'll never see it again, I've just got some random orange thread in here just cause I'm trying to use up thread that I don't use a lot. So basically, you know, I should have cut this in half like on our seam already here, but whatever, we're in here, it's fine. It's just a little more manageable when it's in smaller pieces. So we're just gonna follow our straight line. This machine that I'm using is a 1956 Singer 11G156. Uh, I got it from a good friend of mine. It was his dad's machine. Actually, this whole machine, table, chair, and everything his dad used for years and years and years. And then when he passed away, uh, I ended up making a deal and, and getting it. So if you are trying to buy a sewing machine because you want to do upholstery work at home, you know, there's, you want an industrial machine, obviously. Industrial machines, you can buy them used for pretty cheap. My first machine I bought for $200. So I would say the average price is usually about $500 to $1,000. Uh, the main thing that you want is you want it a walking foot so that it feeds it through. Uh, the button on the side over here is for, it reverses it so that you can do a lock stitch. That's an important thing. And I would say the other, important thing is stick to a brand name like Singer or Faf or Juki. Uh, there's a lot of offshore machines that are totally capable and work good but an offshore so I should say offshore like I'm pretty sure Juki that's I don't think that's a North American brand but anyway, when you get to like the not common brands I should say 
you know, much like if you buy a not common brand welder, you know, that welder will still work really good. But if you're ever in a situation where you need to service that machine or buy parts for that machine and it's some weird off-brand machine, you're not going to find parts. This 1956 Singer, I can still buy everything for it. Uh, most sewing machine technicians, they know and understand this machine. So anytime I've ever had an issue, they can fix it. Super easy, no big deal. Parts in stock. So that's what I would suggest if you're looking to buy a sewing machine. And, you know, also much like welding, it takes five minutes to learn how to sew, but the rest of your life to get good at it. All right, I'm just gonna sew all these up until they're done. Then we'll fold them and do our, the tuck and roll part. Step one is done. All our individual little pleats are sewn in. So now if we were just gonna leave it as a pleated seat, we'd be done, we could move on. But because we're doing tuck and roll, we gotta do it all over again. This time, however, I'm gonna snip this in half first, just to make it a little bit easier to manhandle through the machine. So after we snip it in half, when we go to put it back through the machine, we're gonna take this edge now and fold it just like that and run our stitch through there again. And then when it opens up, you know, you won't see the seam. Before we do that, I'm gonna change out this orange thread for some white thread. I know that I just said you won't see the stitch, but sometimes if you have a contrasting thread in there and it gets kind of like pulled the right way, if you look really close, you can sometimes see the stitch, even though you're not supposed to. But if we use a white stitch, then, you know, it doesn't like jump out like, wow, look at this bright orange thread on this white. Make sense? Thought so. <laughs> we we'll are cut in half now. So this is the backrest part and over here is the cushion part. We've got our white thread in the machine. So, like I was saying, we're just gonna, along the stitch that we just did, we're just gonna fold it over. And, ah, let's flop that up there. We're just gonna fold it over and then run it through the machine one more time. Do a little lock stitch so it doesn't come apart on us while we're working. And you just stitch right along that fold until we get to the very end. Do another lock stitch so it doesn't come apart. That's why the little lock stitch reverse backup handle guy is important. So now when we open this up, no more stitch. We got no stitch. Just like before, we're gonna run through the whole thing until there's none left. Alright, we're on the next day now. 
yesterday I finished sewing all these up and I went ahead and did the other one as well. So remember I was saying we might have to add on. Well, I know we got to add on. Let's lay this on top here and we've got our first seam where it needs to be. Our end folds over. We got our 3 8 seam allowance. And if we go down here, you can see we're short. So there's seam number 20. Remember, we need a 23, right? There's 20. There's 21, 22, and 23. So we got to add one. Well, this one's already there. We just got to sew it up. And then we got to add on one more seam and then another one. So we're going to go ahead and do that now. So I got these two little cutoff pieces here. As you can see, I've already drawn our extra seams on here and that is because I just did all this but I forgot to push record. So I'll run you through it again. I found this piece of scrap that is, you know, the right size. It's a little bit too big, which is okay. I just laid this on here and that gives us, this is seam 20, 21. This would be 22. 23 and then here is our end one. So we're going to cut this off here and glue it to this piece of scrim. Then when we sew these two pieces together, because they get sewn like this obviously and then you flip it open and when you flip it open it's going to look exactly like these ones here. Nobody will ever know that it was made out of two pieces because our original piece was too short. This little piece of scrim that I'm going to use, I'm going to use it this way. Notice it's a little bit short. That doesn't matter because this corner that we're working on is going to end up being this corner down here. And as you can see, our last couple pleats are short. So that little corner that's notched out because our scrim's too short, is going to be right here. It's going to get cut off anyway, so it doesn't matter. So that way we can utilize this scrap piece here and just save a little bit on material. On second thought, I am gonna use the scrim this way because I was just glancing at it again and it's actually these two that are gonna get cut off. This one here still goes all the way to the bottom. So it's all right, we'll just do it this way. Just like before, a little bit of glue and then we'll cut this out right on the seam here. We'll save this piece for our other section. I don't know if we'll have to add on to it or not yet. I have not measured the cushion. Sometimes the cushion's not always as wide as the backrest, you know, with like the inner wheel tubs and stuff like that. I'm assuming it probably will be, but I don't want to make any assumptions until I know for sure. So we'll just set this aside. And now we can just sew these guys together. All right, let's open this up. See how it looks. Bam. Can't even tell. Even when you pull it tight, looks exactly the same. I'm just trimming these end pieces off just to make it all the same size again. And then we can lay it on top of our backrest and see how it turns out. Line our first seam up again. Per 
perfection. We've got this seam here, this seam here, with our 3 8 seam allowance. It's like right flush right now, and we're supposed to be 3 quarters of an inch, but this is super stretchy, so we can stretch that last little bit. It just kind of bunches up when it's like this. But yeah, that is great. Ah, uh, let's move on to step two now before we cut this apart. And we gotta sew up some piping. We are gonna have blue piping along here. So we need a piece of blue that long. And then we're gonna have cream piping. Follow this line all the way along here. You can see the way this originally went together this piece goes that way and we're not going to do it that way because we're going to have our piping go this way to match the front so when we cut this apart to make a pattern out of it rather than follow these stitches here we'll just cut it you know that way where's a piece of chalk i can draw it on there just a bit so you guys can visualize Probably about there, we'll start to taper it. So that'll go that way instead, rather than this way. And then this seam here, you know, we'll just come that way instead. Well, we'll cross that bridge later. First, we need some piping. We'll get a quick measurement. From there to there, there. To there, to there, that's 50, 60, I don't know, we'll make it like 62 inches or so. So, blue, 62 inches, and then our cream, that's 10, 24, There's 60. Fourteen. Twenty-six. Thirty-six. Uh thirty-six two, we'll call it forty. So what's forty and sixty is a hundred. Where'd my chalk go? There it is. white 100 inches. I'll probably run downstairs and measure the cushion as well. That way we can just make all our piping at once, just like how we did all our tuck and roll at once. So I went and measured the cushion downstairs and it is just a little bit longer. It's 105 inches and the backrest we needed 100 inches. So to, for simplicity, I'm just gonna make them both 105 inches if your piping's a little bit too long that is okay. I've got our roll laid out up to 105 inches is right here. It looks like I've already made some piping out of this little corner here. So because this roll is starting to get a little weird, this is like the fourth seat I've made out of this roll. Um, we've got really long skinny sections, so it's which is great for making piping because you can make it in one continuous piece. If you did not want to ruin your roll, like to get more life out of your roll, you can always make your piping strips this way on the roll rather than up the roll. And then you just sew them together. The downside of that is you have a seam, but sometimes you can put your seam in a spot where it would like not normally be seen and you can get away with it that way. So there's our 105 inches here. I'm using this angle iron straight edge again to make our strips. Basically, it's like, I think an inch and a half wide. There's one, and here's the second one. Once we get these laid out, then we just simply cut these strips out and wrap that around some piping core and run it through the sewing machine. Just like so.
Well, I just cut out both our cream strips to make piping. And I went to cut out the blue piping strips. And that's when I hit some devastating moments. Devastation. Devastation has just kicked in. I don't have enough blue to do this seat at all. I don't know where it went because I know I definitely measured and ordered enough when I did the front seat to do the back seat as well. But maybe I didn't measure properly and I didn't have enough or maybe I used it on another project and don't remember. But either way, it means I can't finish this seat right now because I am like way too short. This is all I got left and this isn't wide enough to do this. It's not wide enough to make piping in one piece or anything. So we're going to have to continue on later, which is a huge bummer because I was totally like in the zone on this and like, you know, I've been procrastinating about doing this back seat for like two years now. And finally I'm like, we're doing it. We're going to do it. The car is not leaving the shop until the back seat is done. It's like right now at the time of filming, this is that like weird, awkward spot between like Christmas and new year's when it's like Sunday for six days straight. So that's what I've been doing on this like little weird break. Unfortunately, during the break, the place that sells this material to me, they're not open. So you know, the order won't even get made until the new year. So we'll just, uh, I guess I'll just archive this footage and we'll pick up in a bit. What am I going to do now? I guess I could go work on my 32. That old thing. Back to sanding. All right. Well, it is 15 days later and we've got some material. So yeah, they were closed until January the 2nd. So that's when the order got placed and then it took a week or so for it to actually get shipped. And now we're back on the car again, back on the seat. This is a, I always save this plastic that it comes wrapped in because that's what I use for making templates. Let's open this up and see how it compares. Because this is from one roll and this is like, this is two years later that I've ordered this stuff. So sometimes it doesn't always match exactly depending on when it was made. But it's really close. This stuff is just a little, a little darker. It'll be fine though, because this is going on the back seat and the front seat's done in this. They'll never be side by side. All right, so we needed my marks are still here, my measurements. We need 62 inches of piping core. So I'm gonna lay that out. We're gonna go up the roll, because to go the width of the roll, I think these rolls are only 55 or 50. Standard is like 54 inches, but sometimes they come even as wide as 56 inches. This one's 55 inches. So if our piping was only gonna be 55 inches, we could just cut a strip off the end, but because we need 62 inches, we're gonna go up the roll this way to get our one piece. All right, now that we've got all our material cut out for piping, we can sew it into actual piping now. This is piping core. This is just a big, long roll of little plastic tube and you wrap the material around it and sew it up. You can also buy pre-made piping such as this, which I do keep for like, you know, common stuff like black piping that I use all the time. I've got this super cool old tinsel piping for 60s style interiors, but the majority of the time I just make piping like so. Here's a couple scrap pieces here. There's a special foot in the machine here for piping 
you'll see that this has a little kind of curve to it and when you put the foot down it's got that little circle in there that is the guide for piping so you can leave this foot in the machine the whole time and do your regular upholstery so if you're gonna buy a machine and get a piping foot or any kind of foot just get a piping foot and leave it in there all the time so the basic theory is you take your piping core like this and wrap the material around it like that and then run it through the sewing machine and that sews it together which gives you your shape like that we're gonna do the white first because we still got white thread in the machine Drop our foot down. I think I'm gonna move the camera to the other side so that my arm isn't blocking the view. Back and do our little lock stitch and then we can sew it tight. We've got all our piping finished and now we're ready to cut our pattern apart. So before we did that, you got to kind of study it and see how it goes together because there's a certain order in which you have to sew all this together. So I just kind of figured it all out. You can tell just by looking like studying it, how it goes together. I have also put some lineup marks all around here. So we're gonna transfer all these lineup marks on our new panels too. And that is so that when we are sewing these panels together, as long as our lineup marks keep lining up, we know that we are, you know, this didn't get shifted over a little bit and this is a little wonky, you know, it keeps everything in line. It's like a little guide. So how does this go together? Well, seats are pretty much all the same. You've got your like surface or your plate your top plate, they would call it. And then you've got your band that goes around it. So this particular seat has two bands. It's got like the nice band, the visible band, and then it's got the not visible band. And this was, is usually made out of a, a cheaper material because it's not seen, so it doesn't have to look good just to save a little bit of money. Our top plate is gonna end up being one piece. We're going to have our blue and our pleats sewn together first. So that's why these are labeled number one. Now we got to study how the rest of it goes together. This little corner we're rounding off here. And then we're going to have a seam here rather than a seam that way. So we can't sew this piece to this piece because then we won't be able to sew this piece on. So after our top plate is done, we got to sew our band together. So this is going to be the second piece that we put together. That's why I've got it marked number two. If we go over to the other side here, we've got three. That's the third piece that gets sewn together. So we've got one, two, three. Once these are sewn all up, we've got our plate, our sewing plate, and we've got our top band put together but we still got to do this bottom band. So after step three, we are going to find, do, 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 where did it go here? Oh, I got ahead of myself. We got to finish this band off because it doesn't end here. It goes all the way to here. So after we sew number three, then we're going to sew number four. Then we're going to sew number five. And if you look, that comes down like that next, which means our next piece, our seam number six is going to be sewing this top plate to our first band. When that's all done, we'll have, this will all be one piece. Then we gotta do our lower band. 
So number seven is gonna be this piece getting sewn to this piece. Number eight will be this piece sewn to this piece. That will complete our lower band. And then we can take our lower band and sew it to the top plate, which will be seam number nine. And that seam goes from there all the way around to there. When we get to that point, then we will have a completed seat cover ready to install. These little marks here are kind of like lineup marks. That is where like this seam is going to come along here. That is where that seam is going to end. So I've got those in a couple spots, I think. Uh, yeah, right here I've got one, meaning that on, because this is going to be a solid blue piece, right? And our seam needs to end at that point there. So that's what those represent. I'm going to flip this over now, and it should have some hog rings on the back side. We're going to pull these hog rings off, pull the cover off. Oh, hey, man. We got another piece on here that I didn't even realize. So that looks like it goes on after everything else. So we'll just make a note of that. That'll be piece number 10. To get your hog rings off, I just use a simple pair of side cutters, grab it, twist, and pull. Just like so. You're gonna go all the way around the whole seat until it's free. All the hog rings out, we can now remove the cover. They usually just kind of like roll off. Oh, you can hear it tearing apart because it's so brittle. trying to salvage the, the padding. I don't want to call it foam because it's not foam. Foam hadn't been invented yet. Normally this is destroyed and I end up having to replace it like we're going to have to do on the lower cushion. But this backrest, the foam is in, or not the foam, the not foam is in really nice shape. So we're going to reuse it. Uh, if this was a front seat, I'd probably put new stuff in, but because it's a back seat, Back seats, one, they have very little traffic for the amount of people that sit in the front seat compared to the back seat, they hardly get used. And two, because it's the back seat, it hardly gets used. So I'm not too worried about putting new foam in. We can set this aside. We've got these little pieces to make note of. They're just like little backing support pieces to go in there. Look at all the dirt that came out of there. And now we've got our cover that we are going to cut apart in the reverse order that it goes together. So this back panel up top here that we didn't realize was there, number 10, I'm gonna put some lineup marks on there and then we'll cut that piece out first, followed by number nine, number eight, all the way back down to number one. The uh, cool thing about doing it that way is that way like confirms that the order you laid it all out in is going to work because if it comes apart backwards with no issues, it should go back together properly with no issues. All right, so to get this apart, you can either just use scissors and cut it apart along the seam. When you do that though, you're probably gonna cut the seam allowance off. So you have to remember to add the 3 eighths of an inch back on, or you can use a seam ripper, which I have lost. I just had it a moment ago. There it is. So the seam ripper, you just go in and ever so carefully pull each stitch apart. It takes a little bit longer but it makes for a more accurate pattern because it maintains your seam allowance. See this little like 3 8 edge on the back side of the seam? You need that. 
That's so that the stitching doesn't just like pull through the end. So I'm gonna go through this in the reverse order, blow them all apart, and then we'll have all the panels to lay out. Our cover is now dissected into all 10 components. So from here, we can start laying it out. Our lower band that's not visible, we'll just make that out of, I'll go through my scrap bin and see if I get any scrap material that would work good for that so that we're not using the, the good material where we don't need to. We can save that for another project. This area here is going to be our tuck and roll section. So that's gonna get laid on top of that and then we'll trace it out. The rest of these pieces are all gonna be blue. So we're gonna lay those out on the blue. We'll probably do that first. I've rolled our blue material out and we've got our little cutoffs that we had set aside earlier and they're gonna work great for some of these little pieces. We're just gonna basically trace this out with a white grease pencil. Now keep in mind, these seams here, like we cut this seam out and this seam out rather than using the, the stitch ripper. And what that does is you lose your seam allowance. See right here, we've got where our stitch used to be and we've got our three eighths of an inch for our seam allowance. So this here, when we trace that out, we're gonna have to keep that in mind and add three eighths of an inch to this edge all the way around. Same with all along here that in there. This, these are those corners that we rounded off along here. So just make a note of that. Once we get these traced out, we'll cut them out. And then our big piece here, that we have to do in the fresh roll. So this is what they look like all traced out. We transferred all of our lineup marks on here, put our numbers down, Number four, number four, seam number three, seam number three, and then of course added, you know, three eighths of an inch to the ends that we've cut here. So we got all those done. Let's go ahead and cut these out with some scissors, and then we'll just put those to the side for now. With these pieces all cut out, we can now move on to our big piece. So this piece is too wide to go like across the roll, even if, you know, we cut some off here for our piping, but even then like we'd still be too, too wide. So we're gonna have to go up the roll like such. So when I lay this stuff out, I try to do it in a way that like wastes the least amount of material. And again, we're gonna have to add our 3 8 seam allowance all the way along here, as well as all our lineup marks. So I've cut this one out, but I've cut it out a little bit big. And that's because there's one more step that we need to do before we cut out its actual shape. So it's flat, right? And our tuck and roll stuff, our tuck and roll parts, they're on some half inch scrim. So the tuck and roll and this are gonna get sewn together. But if we keep this flat, as you can see, this is gonna sit a half inch lower than this. So what we need to do is glue this to the same half inch scrim, and that way it builds this up so that it's on the same plane as that. Once we glue it to the scrim, then we can cut it out and then we get a nice crisp cut all the way along. Now our other pieces over here that we've cut out, we don't need to do that because they wrap around this curve here and they're gonna be on a different plane. So there's no need to add the scrim to there because we don't need to build that up to the same plane. Does that make sense? All right, Mr. Man, I gotta spray some glue. So should probably move or your mom's gonna be angry. All right, once you've cleared the room of babies, critters, anything else that's uh, 
I don't like mint blue. I'm just gonna lightly spray this down. Kind of similar to before, this is mostly just to hold it until we sew it, because once you sew it in place, it's not really gonna go anywhere. So by gluing it together and then cutting it out, it gives you such a nice crisp edge. So I've got all our blue pieces put aside over here. Our third band, the one that you don't see, or was it the second band? I guess it's the second band because there's only two bands. But the one that you don't see that was originally made out of this like canvas or whatever, I just cut it out of blue stuff as well because I had a cutoff of blue stuff that everything fit really nice on. So there was minimal waste. And I know you'll never see it, but it kind of bothered me. I had actually dug out a scrap piece to make it out of that was like an olive green. And it just, I don't know, it just bugged me because I know like no one will ever see it. But while I'm installing it or if someone ever took it out, they would see it. And that bugged me. Moving on to our pleated section. So again, this we just laid on top. We had our lineup mark on the fourth pleat in, added our three eighths seam allowance all the way along. I don't know if you guys remember at the beginning of this video or I don't know, near the beginning of it, I said I had a trick on how to make things symmetrical. And that trick is rather than tracing this as is, cause you know, this uh, like we just freehand cut that, that side and that side are slightly different. So to get around that, what I did was trace this side as is, but then for that side, I did a mirror image. I, oh, we got something weird going on here. There we go. I made a mark where that fourth pleat was when it was still on this side. And we're just gonna transfer that back to this side and trace out our same seam allowance or extra three eighths for a seam allowance. And that way that makes sure that this side and this side are in fact exactly the same. So we're gonna cut that out and then We'll start sewing all this together. So we've got this cut out now. Step one, if we go back on our notes here, we've got one, is to sew this piece to this piece. However, we gotta put our piping in there. So there are some upholstery guys, the shop that I learned how to do upholstery at, they really pushed this. They were a production shop about how you should be able to sew your two panels and your piping all together in one shot through the machine. I have never had good luck with that. It's never worked out good. And I always spend more time taking it apart to fix it and redo it than it is to just sew your piping to one piece first and then sew your two pieces together. I'm gonna sew the piping to our solid piece first. And the reason for that is piping doesn't really have much stretch. Like that's a, that's a plastic tube in there. So it's not super stretchy. And as we talked about earlier, our tuck and roll area, like if we line that and that are supposed to line up, and then when we get down here, this is supposed to line up with this, and then this is supposed to line up with this. And as you can see, we are way out. And that is because this kind of shrinks together when you're sewing it. So you need to stretch it back apart. And if we sew our piping to here first, that's not gonna happen. So we'll sew our piping to here because this is the size that we want it to be. And then when we're sewing it, we just put a little bit of tension on this when we run it through the machine to stretch it out and just make sure that our lineup marks land where we want them to be and everything will be happy. All right, we've got seam number one 
sewing up. It worked out really good. We hit all our lineup marks. So now we're just going to keep doing those steps, but through all the orders. So number one is done. Number two is next. We're going to sew this to this. Then number three, this gets sewn to this. Number four, this to this and so on. We're just going to keep going in that order until it's all sewn up. Uh, at step six, where that whole band gets sewn into our top plate here, we're going to have to stop and put our piping. We've got our cream piping that goes around there, but that's, you know, the exact same thing that we just did there. You sew your piping on and then you sew your bands together. So I'm going to switch it back to time lapse and I'll quickly sew all this up. I say quickly, it'll probably take me about an hour, but for you, it'll be like 25 seconds and then we'll have a finished seat cover and we can install it. All right, this is all sewn up and ready to hog ring on. So your hog rings are really simple. This is a hog ring. These are hog ring pliers. You can just get these on Amazon. The hog ring sits in there like that. And when you get your piece where you want it, you just squeeze it. And bam, done. So when you put your seat cover on, turn it inside out lay your top plate on, line up your corners and stuff where you want them to be, and then you just roll it on like so. If you don't do it this way, if you just have it right side, like not inside out, and try to pull it over, you're gonna get wrinkles and stuff in places where you don't want wrinkles. So we'll pull this all the way around, and then we'll flip it over, and start hog rigging. These pieces went in there. I don't know how critical those pieces are, but whatever. We're in here, might as well put them in. Okay, so when you're ready to start hog ringing, I usually will line my corners up where I want them to be, and then I'll go to the center, pull it tight, roll the material so it's a little thicker, Put a hog ring in. Now I will go and do this side and then do the middle and the middle corners. From there, you want to split the difference. So if this one's done and this one's done, our next one is going to be here. Then we're going to go, these two are done, we're going to go here. And that way it kind of pulls it all evenly. If I was to start here and go all the way around, by the time I get over here, things are gonna be so weird and distorted. It just, it never works out that way. So you always kind of just do, do your centers, do your corners, and then just work the middle, split the difference. Sometimes you gotta take your hog rings back out, pull it a little tighter. It's kind of a trial and error thing. All right. Quickly hog ring this on and then we're done. We're all hog ringed on and here is our finished product. Turned out great. You want to make sure that all your piping rolls over the edge on all your corners and stuff, and that your seam allowance on your piping, like the little 3 8 flap on the back, you want that all folded 
on the radius of the curve and make sure it's all going the same way, not some this way, some this way, some that way, because that'll make your piping look kind of wonky. So now we can take our covered seat backrest and wipe it with some little bit of wax and grease remover to get rid of all our little lineup marks and stuff. That stuff will all wipe right off and any little smudges and stuff that we got on it while we were putting it together, we can wipe all that down and install it in the car. So while this is technically ready to install in the car, we're not gonna install it in the car in this video, mainly because it's raining outside right now and really cold and I don't have space in the shop to bring the car in. Plus, there's a couple other things I wanna do before this goes in. Um, I wanna make, there's no parcel tray or package shelf in the car right now. So we, I wanna make one of those because that's a lot easier to do when the seat is not in the car. Plus, we still have our cushion to do. We've only done the backrest. We're kind of like only half done technically, although to install this doesn't require that. But that, we got a lot of work to do on that still. So I'm gonna do that in the next video because if I was to cover how to make all the foam, and we don't have patterns for this, this seat still had a cover on it so we could make a pattern. We don't have patterns for that one, so we gotta go over that. This video is gonna be three hours long if we do it all in one. It's already really long. And I know some of you guys like long videos, are all like, oh man, if you made a two hour long video, I'd watch the whole thing. And that's awesome, but most people don't. Most people, they got about you know a 45 minute attention span. So we're gonna call this video here, and then in the next video, we'll do our foam work. We'll make our patterns, we'll sew it all up. The, all the hard part, this stuff is already done, sitting over here, ready to go. So the sewing part will be a lot less, but we still got a lot of work with the foam. So make sure to subscribe and hit notifications so that when that video comes out, you guys know all about it. Thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. As always, make sure to check out the website, lgspeedcustom.com, where you can get some LG Speed and Custom Merch. I really, really appreciate all of you that buy merch. That is, YouTube doesn't pay a whole lot, so when you buy merch from the website, it kinda, it really helps. It makes it worthwhile to do all these videos, so. Yeah, thanks again for watching. We'll see you on the next video.